You know those moments in TV shows and movies where they like crunch up the script and throw it away because I'm going off book. That's what's happening right now, except there was never a script in the first place. It might look like I'm, I'm about to go on vacation. I kind of am. I'm going back to Australia for a couple of weeks. I'm going to make videos while I'm out there, but it's mostly just to see my family. I don't really have time to script a whole video, so let's see how much trouble I'm going to get in today. So here are a bunch of games I've been playing and if they're worth it, and they're pretty much all on Switch, except for the ones that I couldn't play on Switch because they ran and looked so bad, it forced me to download them on my Steam Deck. That's too long of a title, so I'll probably just do this. Cool. First, let's talk about a cozy game set in the ocean with fish and crabs. <laughs> Another crab's treasure. I decided I would check it out on Switch. I was streaming it live on Twitch, and the, immediately as the game started, my Switch struggled to load in the world. Would what is that performance? Oh, left. no. Oh, the Switch version. Needless to say, I booted up the Steam version so that I could compare, and the two games side by side once I was in the game, it wasn't as bad. The 30 to 60 frame difference was pretty clear. The Switch version, it was playable, just a little rough around the edges. It's the kind of game where you want to have it perform as good as possible. If you've ever played a Souls-like game before, that's this game, but with fishies and crabs. I didn't really know what to make of this game leading up to it. It looked charming, it looked cute, but those two things don't really mesh well with the dark and brooding, intense style of a Souls-like. But it really works. But one of my favorite things about Another Crab's Treasure is you're not just playing as a crab for silly goofs and gaffs, the shells that you find around the world and can switch out to really change up the gameplay so much. Heavier shells will slow you down and lighter shells allow you to be more nimble on your feet. But of course, they're not as durable, meaning they can't take as many hits before they break and then you'll be left without a shell or nudie judy running around with your pee-pee out. And if you get hit like that, well, you get hit in the pee-pee and tell me how it feels. Each shell has a unique special ability too. Like if you adon a soda can, you can shoot soda bubbles that will actually homing missile, find out and seek and attack enemies. Coconut, you turn into Sonic the Hedgehog, bombard enemies with a rolling attack. As you play through the game and you kill bosses and creatures, you'll of course get materials that you can use to level yourself up. There's also a skill tree where you can unlock whole new abilities to play with. It's a, she it's a shell of a time. <laughs> The voice acting is so much better than I expected. The writing is really charming and hilarious. But in amongst all of that, you still have a brutal Souls-like game. The first big real boss fight of the game against the Duchess Crab, that fight took me hours. I yell and I swore and I screamed and I threw my controllers until I finally beat it. And it felt rewarding. It felt like that classic Souls-like wave of relief satisfaction of I finally did it. That's how you know another Crab's treasure is a good souls like i went to target today and bought this vacation shirt <laughs> i have so many vacation i i think i'm getting old that just seems like an old person thing to do this does have spongebob on it though <laughs> kim and i are going to be gone for a couple of weeks and australia is pretty notorious actually for just not having content that you can watch literally everywhere else in the world. It's always blocked. Our uh, Netflix sucks. <laughs> so that's where Surfshark VPN might come in handy. Because with Surfshark VPN, you can just take your location and put it back into the US or wherever you want to go and then watch content from that place. While Kim and I are away on vacation, we'll still be able to watch all of our shows. A VPN doesn't just have to be for fun. Although, oh boy, is it fun. <laughs> that sounded like I was lying. It's also used to encrypt your internet data and protect you and your privacy while you're shopping, lurking, browsing, doing possibly questionable stuff online. Using a virtual private network, it essentially creates a secure tunnel around you and your information and your data, making it so that nobody can see what you've got going on. There are tons of other benefits to using a VPN too, like better deals while shopping, security on public Wi-Fi. With Surfshark VPN, you get a 30-day money-back guarantee so there's no risk in trying and one Surfshark account you can use it on all of your devices so if you want to support my content please click the link down below go over to Surfshark use code beat-em-ups and get yourself an extra four months four that's like almost half a year let me surf on out of here 
get back to the video. <laughs> you want to talk about the other ocean game? Now that I butted you up like a juicy butted crab. Back when this game had its reveal trailer in a Nintendo Direct fairly recently, I said this probably isn't the kind of game that we want to get in the Switch's last year. The whole idea of Endless Ocean is that you're in this gorgeous underwater magical world marveling the environment. I would want that to be something that we get on the Switch too. Something to really showcase what the new console can do rather than what we got these stale environments with kelp and seaweeds at the bottom of the ocean that don't move. It doesn't feel like it's living and breathing. Don't get me wrong, they've designed over 500 sea life creatures for this game. Some of them do look pretty good, but then you have like this spiky starfish thing. I mean, it's cool they added 30 players to the game. You can explore the ocean with all these other people, but for me, that was never what Endless Ocean was about. It's supposed to be my journey. What's Harry doing in here? They say it's endless ocean. It's not really. It randomly generates an ocean when you start a new dive, but it's very much a set strict playing area. And then as I'm playing, I keep bouncing off the wall. It just goes to remind me every time that I am just stuck in this one square to explore. It is a pretty big square and there's certainly things in here to find like deep ravines and shipwrecks. And every time I find one of those, it is a really cool experience, but I feel like they're pretty few and far between with over half of this generated experience being murky blue water and nothing but just sand below me. Another thing that makes this game feel really cheap is the AI that reads every thing in the game. It's like a text-to-speech bot, and it sounds horrible. Be providing support to you during your dives. I've played so many budget games on the eShop for videos, and almost all of them use text-to-speech because it's immensely cheaper than hiring a voice actor. Please begin moving so that I can confirm your location. So when I hear it in a game like this that I've spent $50 on, I can't help but feel like this is a budget money-saving tactic that they've used, and it really sounds horrible. When you scan the creature, you should be able to see its biological data. This was the one more thing in the direct, by the way. If I'm spending $50 on a game, it does feel a little lazy to not voice that game and just do text to speech for the whole thing. It wouldn't even be as bad if this was just for the sea life descriptions, but there's a whole story mode that really has a lot more talking than it does playing, and that's all text to speech generated too. It just feels really disjointed and rushed. I think pretty much all of my issues come down to the price tag. I mean, if this game was $20 and it was just a endless ocean experience that you could play with 30 other players, that'd be really cool. We can all play it in the last year and have some fun with it. I don't think anyone should rush out and buy this game for $50. If you can get it cheaper than that, there's definitely fun to be had here. I mean, even as I was recording footage for this video, I found myself having a hard time quitting the dive and stopping recording the footage because I did feel like if I just went a little further, I could scan a new fish. And then it becomes that like Pokemon-esque, I gotta catch them all mentality. I just think there's too many great gaming experiences right now to be spending $50 on Endless Ocean Luminous. I mean, for example, you could buy two copies of Animal Well. I finished Animal Well last night. It only took me four and a half hours, but I will say that they packed so much into that four and a half hours to make it such a memorable experience. I feel like Donkey is getting all the credit for the game when he He's not the one that made it. Shout out to the developer who did an absolutely incredible job. It is at its core a Metroidvania, but it's not like any Metroidvania I've ever played before. And visually, the pixel art and the lighting and the atmosphere in this game are all breathtaking. To explain the love, care, and detail that went into this game, if you're playing on a PC and you drag the window around your desktop, all of the vegetation in the game will move with the windowed box. If you're playing on Switch, you can just touch the screen and interact with the environments that way. It's a little detail, but it really showcases how much emotion and love was pumped into the development of this game. Animal Well is a passive experience. There's no attacking, no weapons, no combat. There's also no dialogue. It's just your journey. And yet everything either just makes sense to you right away or will reveal itself to you when the time comes, which made the game really addictive. And I said it was a Metroidvania like one I've never experienced before, 
and I think a lot of that came down to the puzzles and the items. You don't find an item that gives you just a double jump. It gives you a bubble one that you can make a bubble and then use the bubble as a platforming mechanic. Another one of the weird items is a slinky. I didn't even think I would need something like that. And then the second I got it, it opened up so much more of the game for me. The map in the world that you can explore is really big and every single screen had a different puzzle. The ways that I solved puzzles made me feel smart. There are also these hidden eggs scattered throughout the entire world and there are loads of these and those will have their own little mini puzzles that you have to solve to get to them. I'm going to ruin one for you because I felt so smart when I figured it out. I had a feeling that there was something that I couldn't get to off the side of the screen, but these platforms made it impossible for me to get there. And I just had this thought, what if I took the frisbee and I bounced it in between the two platforms as they were moving along and I rode the frisbee? That actually worked. It makes the game so that even though I beat it in four and a half hours, there would be so much more enjoyment to dive back in and to collect all of these eggs and solve all of the little mini puzzles that go along with them. The last thing is just the sound design. I played it with headphones on because at some point I realized how cool all of the noises and the sounds and how eerie a lot of it was. I think it is a nine out of 10 game. It reminds me of games like Hollow Knight. It reminds me of games like Celeste. It does feel like a new entry into that ecosystem of our Metroidvania indie gems. It's clear that Donkey found this game, saw its potential, saw how fun it was and wanted that to be his first game. And I think that's very smart because this game is sick. All right, I, I want to quickly talk about some more games. Hades 2, oh boy, what a game. I'm not going to talk too much about it because I haven't played the open beta. I played the tech demo thing that happened a few weeks ago. One of the first things that jumped out to me as a big upgrade, at least visually, is the main character has a full 3D motion range of movement now. And then of course the gameplay is good. There's all new weapons. I, there was like a dagger and a sword weapon. It was awesome. It took me like an hour and a half, I think, to beat the first boss and I cannot wait to play the whole game. That said, I'm not going to play this open beta thing. They've said that they're still going to add characters and story and weapons. So at that point, I feel like I'm not getting the whole game. I was okay with playing an hour tech demo to try it out, but I don't want to play essentially a half-baked version of the game when I know the full release is coming later. I do appreciate the open beta idea. I like that other players are getting to experience it and can give their feedback and tell Supergiant Games what would be good or what can change to make it the best experience possible so that when I play it, it is more refined and better game than it would have been otherwise. But at the same time, I hate that it's out because other people are experiencing it and playing through essentially the whole game and I'm not and I'm missing out. It's such a catch-22. I'm excited to play it when it fully releases. If you want to play it now, what I played in the tech demo was awesome. So your 30 bucks will not go to waste. Oh, boobies. You played Stellar Blade? Whatever the discourse is about this game, I'm not here to talk about it and I don't care about it. I'm married, you know, I have a wife. I just like video games. I've been so excited to play this game and it's not because of this. But that of course helps. I love hack and slash style games. I'm also a huge Nier Automata fan. I love that game to death. This was being compared to that because it also has an attractive robot android lady protagonist with a sword who kills things. That really is as far as the comparison should ever have gone though. Nier Automata is a whole nother beast from its lore and storytelling and characters to its insane gameplay. It's so many things crammed into one package. Stellar Blade is really really good, but don't compare it to that just because there's a cute android girl. It's a hack and slash tied in with a souls like. Everything down to the same things we talked about with another crab's treasure. I'll say that the story is a little bit of a snooze. I enjoy the world that they've created. A lot of the designs of the tech and the characters. Well, I mean, none of the characters are inherently that interesting. I'm very much playing it for the gameplay. And that you have your light and heavy attacks and you can chain them together in different orders and combinations to do different combos and moves. There's a ton of different upgrades and abilities that you can unlock to add to the combat. There is a parry like in a Souls-like game. And when you chain all of that together, it makes for some really flashy, fun and fast paced combat. I wasn't super sold on the game until I made it through the first linear slog and got to the big first boss fight with the dude with the donut head. That fight took me like five or six tries. And when I 
finally took it down. That felt super fun and rewarding. And then immediately after that, you get thrown into a semi-open world zone type area. Now you had more freedom as to what you could do and where you could go and more side missions to pick up. So it really expanded and opened up from there. A lot of it plays like an old Xbox 360 game, but to be honest, that's kind of why I like it. So it's weirdly nostalgic playing through this game. There's really not that much to hate about the game, other than the platforming. The platforming does suck and really does do my head in. And I also don't think anyone would really have paid too much attention to it if it wasn't for... I think that was really the selling point, like the Pokemon and Pal world. That was how we got here. And then it turns out, oh, the game is actually pretty fun. But without that, I don't think anyone would have cared. You guys are going to love this next one. I've been really excited to talk about Little Kitty Big City. I mean, it should be obvious. I love cats. So of course I was going to try this. I mean, it's cute. It's indie. It's little. But if you loved Goose Game, this is Goose Game if you were a cat. That's a good comparison. But there's so much more to Little Kitty Big City because in Goose Game, there was no dialogue. There was no writing. You just kind of went around and messed with people. Little Kitty Big City has some of that, but it also has a story and characters to meet with really charming writing as well. So you start as a little cat who is just sleeping on a windowsill and then has a bad day, lands safely in a trash can, but now you're trying to get home. And to get there, you need to ask for help from other cats or maybe a crow, maybe a little weird bee thing. <laughs> There's quite the cast of cute, furry, and fun animals around the world that you can meet and help them with their troubles, and in turn, they'll help you with yours. But mostly, it's just you pouncing around the world, platforming over everything, collecting shinies for a crow so that the crow will give you fishies that you can eat that will then give you more stamina so that you can explore more of this world. The controls, I mean, they work most of the time, but I find myself clipping into things and the game kind of freaks out when I try and grab onto certain ledges or platforms, but it's also very forgivable because the game is, for one, so charming, but also you're playing as a cat. It's hard to get mad at it when it's so goofy as a game already, and it does work 90% of the time. It's just really cute and charming, and it, again, reminds me of playing Goose Game. It's a fun game to play with Kim. I just like it. Lastly, uh, I want to talk about a game I haven't even played on Switch, and that's Biomutant. I got it on Xbox. On launch. And it was one of those games that Kim actually randomly had interest in watching me play. And we sat down to play it together and I think we got maybe like three or four hours in. God, it was a rough three or four hours. The combat is not intuitive or very fun. The open world is dead, empty, and boring. The whole thing feels like massive jank. And coming to Switch, it does seem like they haven't really changed or improved the game at all. It is just getting a Switch port now. I wanted to talk about it because apparently the Switch port is actually pretty impressive. I mean, it is a decent looking open world game. So anytime one of those get crammed onto the console, if it runs well, people call it a miracle port. If you're looking to play the game, the port is supposed to be pretty good, but the game is still not. You know, it's interesting. I actually looked at the reviews quickly and I found that this is just funny to me. One is a 50 score out of 100 by Cubed3 that said the open world aspect of Biomutant did more harm than good. With the gargantuan post-apocalyptic realm, this heroic mutated rodent will explode explore being mostly an open one and with the rest of the experience being repetitive and unpolished. I agree with that 100%. I don't feel like it needed the open world. But then IGN gave it 80 and said Biomutant conquers a prominent place in the ever-expanding universe of open world games. That was IGN Portugal. I don't know what they're doing over there. So yeah, if you want my thoughts on Biomutant, there they are. I'm not playing it again. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> you can't make me. That's a bunch of games I have and I guess for the last one haven't been playing. I'm sorry this video was kind of rushed. I'm sorry if you like Endless Ocean. I just wanted to get something for you guys to watch before I went away. Let me know what you think of all the games I talked about today. If you like them, if you hate them, like, comment, subscribe. Thank you.